Welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod on the Dub Network. And today we are, I welcome a special guest, a good friend of mine. Ran to him about 10 years ago. Um, you know, I like to do help out with charities around police, first responders, military. And that's where I met this gentleman, a Mr. David Van Sleet. David, how are you this morning? I'm doing fine, Kevin. It's great to see you. Yes, sir. It's been uh it's it's amazing how far we've come, David. From uh, what was it, 2011, 2012? Well, I started in 2011, so I think we connected in 2012. Okay, and uh, just for for our audience here, uh, can you ex- tell them a little bit about yourself and how we got to where you and I are today? Sure. Uh, as I was approaching uh, retirement from the Department of Veterans Affairs, I sort of combined the four passions of my life together. And basically, um, I'm a U.S. Army veteran, so military. Um, I got a degree in prosthetics. so And then I worked for the Department of Veterans Affairs 30 plus years. And I've all, always been a softball, baseball enthusiast. You know, started as a player, then became a coach, then a general manager. So uh, just combine those uh, four different aspects of my life together. And as you know, it's been a heck of a ride since. So, so we when I first met David, he had created a team called the Window Warrior Amputee Softball Team, and it was not affiliated with anything else, right, David? You stayed away from the Wounded Warrior Project, correct? Exactly, exactly. And that was, and that was for what was the reasoning behind that? Well, as I was getting close to uh, retiring from the Department of Veterans Affairs and Prosthetics, I was able to see what was coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan and getting out of uh, rehab at Walter Reed and the Center for the Intrepid. And I said, wow, some of these guys look uh, pretty athletic. I wonder if they've ever played baseball. And uh, the University of Arizona um, obtained a congressional grant and they were going to have a camp for, you know, this uh, people with uh, amputations and disabilities and whatever. And um, we got connected somehow. And then next thing I know, I was able to, you know, help select the 20 guys that were able to go to this uh, camp for a week. And and the reasoning behind creating this, was it was it for... Uh, PTSD type stuff, or was it just to help them integrate themselves back into society coming back from war? Yeah, I wasn't really uh, thinking of PTSD at the time, although we have found out later that a lot of the guys have suffered some type of um, PTSD and TBI and whatever. But uh, I was thinking more of trying to get them back into a mainstream of playing a sport and I just thought maybe this camp would uh, enable them to do that. And then after the camp, they could go back to their local towns and cities and whatever and, you know, join a leg of any any type of uh, ability and any kind. And you never thought it would get to the point where it did, did you? So, I mean, you said you had the camps, which were and, – and how did this even start to, you know, progress? You know, you have a camp here and there, and all of a sudden – now you're you're going all over the country doing more than just these camps. Well, what happened at the end of the week, a couple of the uh, really athletic, very good ball players that were amputees came up and said, "Okay, we completed the camp. Where do we go from here?" And I said, "To be honest with you, you go home because that was my main intention: is let them go home and join a, a local church beer." any type of softball league just to get going. Um, But they were really pressing me. And um, as you know, my father, uh, you know, my father, Jack, uh, he flew out to uh, Arizona from Florida. And so he watched the whole thing. And then when I returned to Florida, he goes, what's going on now? I said, well, I think it's pretty much over. I think we ran our course and the University of Arizona did everything they said they were going to do. And he goes, well, what, what's holding you back from going further? And I said, well, it's it's a financial thing. And so my father um, and about six of his best friends that golf together at a nice country club in Florida said, well, how about if we put on a golf tournament? And so they put a golf tournament on in uh, 
probably about three months after the camp and gave me a nice check. And we went to Maryland, Virginia, and DC and played three games in three days. And, and then, then it's, that's when it exploded. So these, so you go to these, uh, you said you went to DC for the, you know, for these few games and stuff. So how did all of a sudden did these sponsors start coming in as far as, cause you know, prosthetics aren't, aren't cheap one, correct. Correct. And, and then, uh, on top of that, you know, the, the travel and, and building this and how all of a sudden are these sponsors knocking at your door saying, Hey, we want to be a part of this. What, where, where did this all start? Well, the Washington, but well, Louisville Slugger jumped on with my proposal from day one, and they gave all the equipment for the camp. And then when we got the funds to travel to the Met DC metro area, um, that's when the Washington Post did an article on us, and that really set us free as far as going forward because the Washington Nationals obviously heard of us from the Washington Post article. And then it was almost everybody and their brother that wanted to get a piece of this action because we were at the height of the war. Amputations were very, very uh, prevalent. And so that's when these companies started jumping on board and they have stayed with me ever since. And it's, and people don't know Walter Reed hospital is in just outside of DC and, uh, and there was, they do a lot. The nationals do do a lot with these, these soldiers that do come back that are, you know, going through the rehab. And they also go to the facility in San Antonio, correct, David? Yeah. There, yeah at the time there was two main facilities. It was either, um, you know, Walter Reed at Bethesda, which is no longer the facility because they built a newer facility. And then, um, the Center for Intrepid in San Antonio. And that's where a lot, uh, not all, but a lot of the amputees went to rehabilitation. So we, so we continue down this road with, with this. And I, we run into you in, uh, in Sulphur, Louisiana. Jenny Finch had set something up. And uh, I don't know how long you guys had pinned. You guys weren't playing every weekend at this point, were you? Because or where, well, where was the process at this time? Yeah, when we first started, at, when once we first really got known, we were getting pulled in a hundred different directions. So we were playing as much as three week long weekends a month. Uh, Jenny Finch, God bless her. As you know, she's a very, very um, unique individual and a strong supporter. And um, she wanted to do something for the team. And so she invited us to sulfur uh, Louisiana, where she lives with her husband, Casey, and her family. And they had a very nice facility down there. And uh, we went down there to play. And that's where you and I ran into each other. And then uh, we started helping you guys, started helping out a little bit more with you guys traveling through the weekends. And and, and it got to a point where how many, how much were you guys playing in a year? Oh, I've got the records, but I bet you we played – you know, if there's, I mean, you know, we're talking 30 times, 30 times. Yep. All over the place. And, and you're going coast to coast, right? And this was, uh, and this wasn't just for, in, in the beginning, like you said, it just, it was just trying to raise awareness, but it got to a point where these guys started to become really, really good at what they were doing. Yes. And, but this was their, obviously this was what the rehabilitation they were looking for. They were looking to become an athlete again and be a, part of a team again. And, um, this satisfied a lot of their wants and, uh, yeah, we have traveled from coast to coast. Uh, we went over to Japan. We've been to Hawaii twice. Uh, we've, we've covered a lot of mileage. And it's competitive as well. It's not just a, a beer league. So you guys would go to Panama city, right? South Dakota and play in these big, big softball tournaments against able-bodied men and women. Well, we, uh, you know, I'm proud to say that's all we've ever played are able-bodied teams. Uh, um, and then, yes, we have played in a lot of uh, big tournaments, and then we continue to do so now. And the guys were playing, were being, who was the first one invited to the All-Star game to play in the celebrity softball? Yeah, the first one was uh, Matt Kinsey and Saul Bosquez that went to the Major League Baseball celebrity softball game. 
And that kind of really just catapulted these you guys into the stratosphere as far as, you know, people wanting just wanting to be involved with it. And I remember, you know, traveling around with you guys and seeing the enthusiasm, the amount of veterans, just people coming out to see and seeing how competitive and you know, how even how able these guys were, even if they were playing with a prosthetic, because you know, you talk about, you know, the different kinds of prosthetics. You have, you had some guys that were bilateral, some that were just unilateral, um, some with missing arms, missing hands. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's amazing to see the guys, how, you know, this even came about. You had um, different guys with, you know, lost a hand. You had guys that had two fingers left. It was amazing to see how they were able to, to do this. And did it, did it kind of give them a sense of identity again, the camaraderie they had between each other, as well as reconnecting with society back here? Well, there was, you know, a lot of the guys were questioning themselves, uh, but a lot of them had a, a serious pass in baseball. So they knew how to play the game. They just had to re-engineer their self and their body and their prosthetics to play the game at the level they wanted to. And it was surprising to see as you said, you know, somebody with two fingers, no left hand, playing at a top level, um, whether it's in the field or, you know, batting. And, uh, you know, you went to a spring training with us when we went to Vieira, Florida with the Washington Nationals. And, uh, you know, you got to see firsthand so what some of these guys can do. Yeah, I remember the time the guys would get out and take their prosthetics off and race in their nubs across the grass just to just to see. I mean, these guys, you know, the, the life that they, you know, had back in them, you know, the exuberance, just being having having a fun time with it. But that's where it became competitive, where, look, guys, we want to do this. We would need to you want the, the best guys that can do it. But to see, you know, you know where they've started and where they've come. So, you know, in the original, you said, what, 14 uh, well, originally that 20 went to uh, Tucson, Arizona, but then after that, um, you know, it was narrowed down to probably a good 15 or so that jumped on board. And the, uh, so a lot of these guys come back and, you know, have, they're you know, having kids now, married, graduating, yeah, uh, police officers, all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, did you ever imagine it would get to that point? No, but, you know, being a little bit older, uh, you, you know, you realize that people do have to grow up and if they get married and need to support a family and they need to finish college, uh, you know, that life goes on and they have to adjust their schedules and their lifestyle to adapt to all that as well as playing on this team. And uh, it, you're right, because it was it was one of those things where it was full weekends of playing, what, six, eight games a weekend, maybe. And yeah, then, we, played, we played quite a bit, quite a bit on top of trying to, you know, the other events, I guess, that people would have. So it wouldn't just be games. It would be fundraising and everything else to to do it. And it but that's not what it was about. Right. It wasn't about the fun. It was just about getting them back and letting them have fun. And, you know, did you ever think it would get to the point where it did? Oh, not at all. Uh, uh, you know, I saw, I was able, I, you know, I tell people, I'm just an average guy from Burlington, Vermont, who had a successful career, but I was able to see a small fire turn into a wild, major wildfire with this whole thing. And it was basically a runaway train. Just, you know, hold on and enjoy the ride. And it, so this started with, with softball originally, and at least you guys were here a few times uh, being involved and, you know, it just, the, the locker room type mentality, even with the, with the baseball guys that were here. And then you go from softball to baseball. Tell us about that transition. Yeah. So after five years um, with the uh, Wounded Warrior MPG softball team, I decided I was going to step down and move on and, I was really wasn't going to do a whole lot since I traveled so much in five years that I thought I'd put my feet on the ground for a while. But then two years later in 2017, um, you know, the guys that were very successful at softball wondered, you know, geez, I wonder if I could still play baseball. And we said, well, we could find out. So uh, the Washington Nationals, once again, stepped 
forward and gave us their spring training facility uh, in um, West Palm Beach. And um, if my memory remembers correctly, you were there as well, Kevin. Yep. And uh, we had a national tryout. And so the military guys wanted to know how well they stood up against a lot of uh, amputees that maybe weren't military. So it was open to anybody. And boy, has that thing gone crazy since 2017. We literally have the best amputee baseball players probably in the world. And I remember, you know, playing again, even the softball games we would play. I think one of them, we were in Florida and uh, playing against some, some, some veterans as well. And um, I remember, I can't think of the name. The black guy came, he was playing, he came up and you were talking to him, shook his hand and you looked down and he was missing, I think, a piece of his thumb. Right. And it was considered an amputee at that. Right. And you said, well, hey, how about, you know, coming and playing and seeing. And it's one of those things where I don't think, you know, a lot of these guys sometimes think that, yeah, this will be something for me to do. But wait, you're an amputee. You know, I, I think you start with the softball and then you go to the baseball side. And uh, so tell us about some of these baseball guys. I've, you sent me the article the other day about uh, the one arm catcher you have. that was being able to get the Jim Abbott type of being behind the plate and doing this stuff. Well, first of all, from what I've been told by a number of these uh, hand-type amputees, they all started baseball because of Jim Abbott. Um, so, and Jim Abbott has reached out to us and supported us and stuff like that. But this this young uh, catcher we have with one born with one arm is phenomenal. He's a senior at North Dakota North Dakota State University. And believe it or not, he's applying to medical school. He's that good of a student. But he's a very, very avid uh, athlete and baseball player. In fact, he even um, does bullpen catching on the side for the university. So when we heard about him, we heard about him through another one of our players. Uh, he is almost the biggest attraction we have when we go to play because they're mesmerized how fast he can catch the ball flip it, his glove off, catch the ball, and throw out a runner. So he's a young kid. He's only 20 years old right now, but um, phenomenal. Yeah, because I help uh, when we playing against, and you guys go play in, is it the over 40? Is that what it is when you guys go to Vegas? No, uh, we play over 35. Over, over 35, okay, and doing this. And Curtis Pride is, one, is the head coach of the team. I don't know if our listeners, Curtis is the first legally deaf baseball player to play at the major league level. Uh, Curtis is a great man and uh, offers up all his time he can to help David with with uh, this Louisville Slugger Warriors baseball team. So he's he's uh, David's got his hand in everything with everybody else, but the guys that want to be involved and help is just it's it's tremendous. Uh, you have some other guys right that are um, the amputees that are playing as well on that. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, well, we, well, first of all, Curtis Pride, um, what a nice nice. Uh, honest, respectable uh, man, um, and was a major, major high school athlete, but he decided to go with uh, baseball, and as you know, you might have even played against them, Kevin, I don't know. Yeah, but, I did uh, when he was in Anaheim. Yeah, he he's, uh, devotes all his time. Uh, he's never missed a game or a tournament with us, and, you know, he's he's got a family with two kids and a wife, He's a co head college baseball coach, and he works part-time with Major League Baseball in the Office of Inclusion, but yet he still finds time to be our head coach. And he he opens so many doors for us. And so these, oh, go ahead. So these yeah, so these other guys, all the guys except two have played college baseball either before or after their amputation. So that gives you an idea how um, how good these guys are. We've got two pitchers that only have one arm with a hand on it and are both missing their left hands, and they throw hard. One throws about 88, the other one throws about 92, and they can flip that glove so quick that it's back in time in case a line drive comes towards them. But they're just two of many of the guys on the team that are unbelievable. We have a young man who went to East Tennessee on a football scholarship as a quarterback. 
and he's a below knee amputee and he's one of our best pitchers, but he also plays third base for us. And then, you know, we have a couple of guys left over from the softball team that um, they all played college baseball before they went in the military. So they're, they're, they're right on top of the game too. And, you know, that t- our team is always looking for the best amputees in the country and we have found them so far. But if we find another one, we will bring them on as well. And that's so, I mean, I'm sure you get calls daily or about athletes that, that come out because, you know, I think, you know, 10, 12, 15 years ago, that wasn't something you would even think of, of, a, of you know, an amputee coming out and playing just even at, at, at the level that you guys play at against able body uh, guys playing baseball, throwing hard and being able to compete you know, win games and not just be there just for, for, you know, a dog and pony show. You guys are there to, to, to win these, win these tournaments and play and and be competitive. And, and like you said, you're traveling all over doing it. And it's amazing to sit there and see this, to, to be a part of it and watch and just see how much these guys really, really get into this. Well, you know, we just went to uh, Detroit, Michigan over Labor Day and Curtis being a former Detroit tiger, we had more media coverage than we have had, ever had, um, and a great crowd, just a great experience. We played well. Um, you know, when you get asked to come back before you even leave the ballpark, um, and by the way, the ballpark was owned by DJ Lemieux of the New York Yankees, you know, it, obviously we did something right for us to be asked to come back before we even left the ballpark. But these guys take the game seriously. Um, most of them play in a league wherever they live around the country. It's and it's the organization is called Men's Senior Baseball League, owned by Steve Sigler. And there's 3,000 teams in the country. And so wherever you live, there's a team for you somewhere. And so a lot of these guys play during the week with uh, their team in the Men's Senior Baseball League in their city but they drop it and come with us when we go to tournaments. It's and so the baseball side is, it's not even a, it's the awareness, but it's not, it's not a fundraising thing. This is a competitive, you know, bring it in and let's, you know, these guys are going to come in and compete and go for, you know, for a long, long weekends. I think usually we, when you go to Vegas, isn't it during uh was it Memorial day weekend? You guys usually go. Yeah. So normally we go to Las Vegas for the Las Vegas Open over Memorial Day weekend. We go to the MSBL World Series in Phoenix, Arizona. And now we have seemed to jump on board with Florida. So uh, we follow the the weather, to be honest with you, because we play year round and we can, you know, basically go to California, uh, Nevada, Arizona, Florida, um, and then during other times of the year, we can go to other areas to play when the weather's conducive. How many of these uh, of the amputee guys are on playing in college right now of the baseball guys? Well, we just had two graduate this past May. Um, so I would say one, one in college. He's a first baseman uh, pitcher, and he's um, a below – knee amputee so i think we only have one in college right now um but most of them all played and they just used up their eligibility and graduated so you're getting calls daily about guys saying hey we've got amputees here you know to to check out and i know you've asked me just you know i'm always looking to see if if anybody just to be able to pass it along to you because it's not something you can just show up and play this is something where that it's a it's a tryout you know almost as if it's a regular baseball season correct Yes. And um, so, you know, we're very honest with everybody. Our head coaches, uh, you know, you've been out there on the field with us. We have Len Whitehouse that pitched for the Rangers and the Twins. Um, he knows what he's looking for in pitchers. Curtis has played at so many teams in the major leagues. He knows what he's looking for. And so we don't want to embarrass anybody, but we want the best of the best um, because the talent we're playing is. Uh, it's quite good. So we don't want to get embarrassed. So um, it's amazing. There's a lot of younger guys still coming up that play baseball in high school right now that we're well aware of. And they're asking us, when can they join? Um, 
But right now, the, the youngest player on our team is 20 years old. And the oldest player is 42 years old. So these, so you have to be what, at least 18 to be playing with, with, uh, with you. Is that right? Correct. Is that why you're one guy? So there's, so you're starting to get, you're starting to see this uh, more and more of these guys, you know, coming to you to be able to, uh, you know, to, you know, to, to, you know, never thought they would have this opportunity. And like you said, they're, they're, they're continuing on and, and playing and being competitive and, because, I, like I said, watching that one weekend, uh, the center fielder you had, I think, was it the left hand, I think it was left handed, right? I think went to school in Minnesota. Is that correct? Could throw the ball, he could yes. pitch, and he could play in the outfield with and swing the bat. It, it was, I mean, I mean, seeing this is just, it's, it's beyond impressive of what these yeah, guys that, deal with. That young man's name is Parker Hansen, and excellent field. He can play first outfield or pitch. And but he bats with an arm prosthesis, and he I've seen him hit it out of a you know you know a major league distance field. He he's phenomenal. But I'll tell you one thing: this past weekend I saw a play that I've never seen from someone at this ability. Um, we were playing in Detroit, and we were playing an MSBL All Star team, and he uh, Parker was playing left field. Someone hit a shot over his head. Uh, he goes back towards the wall, catches it. There was a guy on first base and the guy took a lead off and kept taking a little further lead off because if Parker didn't catch it, he was going to second. Parker turned around so fast and threw that ball to the first baseman and picked that guy off first base. We could not believe what we saw. In fact, I thought he was overthrowing second base, but he literally caught the guy off base. It's a, it's you know it's like I said when I first even saw some of the softball guys the one arm guys one arm you know Greg Reynolds with one arm you got Leonard Anderson with two fingers left right and these guys are are doing it now they're doing it some of these guys on the baseball side of it and and like you see competing playing against guys that are throwing you know low nineties playing baseball with this stuff I never would have thought you know this would never would have crossed my mind. Um, I mean- I mean, I don't know, Kevin. Maybe one of these days there might be an amputee playing in the major leagues. I mean, um, you just never know where the ability and the talent is going to what level now. And um, with the equipment and the sponsorships, and I mean, we couldn't be doing it without all the – now that uh, Louisville Sluggers with Wilson, Evo Shield, and Dee Marini, we have the best and the best of all types of equipment. And then the sponsors, my God, um, you know, Margaritaville has been with me from day one. And it's amazing what they do for us. They, if we go somewhere and there's a restaurant, they feed us. If we go somewhere and there's a, a hotel or a resort, they put us up in one of their hotels or resorts. Um, they just took a, they just took a couple of us on Margaritaville, Margaritaville at sea, a uh, cruise line. Um, it's amazing what some of these sponsors have done, like Louisville Slugger, MSB, MSBL. We've been their charity for a number of years. And, uh, I know they thoroughly enjoy us going to play in their national tournaments, but um, we couldn't be doing a lot of it without their sponsorship. And then Margaritaville, uh, prosthetic companies. It, it's amazing. It's, it's amazing. That's the big thing. You know, the prosthetics, you talk about the, the advancements in the prosthetics. I know a lot of these guys – you know, with, with the, you know, the amputees below, uh, you know, below the knee, whatnot, as far as the different kinds that these guys use, sometimes they'll use, a, you know, the blade, they'll all, then they'll use a foot. It's, you know, and, but I know with, with, with that comes, you know, they deal with a lot of having to change out their, uh, the sock, correct? Is that what it is? And then they deal with the blistering and everything else. So it's not just something where they just go with this on a daily basis and don't have issues with it, do they? Well, the technology has advanced so far. A lot of the guys that were playing on blades, they play on a modified uh, uh, foot prosthesis now so they don't even have to – they can wear the same prosthesis to the field, play with the same prosthesis, and not have to switch during uh, before and after games or stuff like that. So um, there's a a prosthetist out in uh, Puyallup, uh, Washington, who is very, very high-end, state-of-the-art, 
um, that a lot of our guys go out to see, a lot of our leg amputees, uh, Greg Davidson, and uh, he is, he's got them up on their feet, let me tell you, and he's got them running well. And not just the not just the the legs, but also you know the hands. You talked about um, these guys with with what they're doing. You, um, I saw uh, two of your, one of your guys. Well, actually, one of them was uh, you know that bilateral Zach Brazenia, which is a Fort Worth police officer here now. Um, the second one, right? Only the second one in the U.S. behind right. Matias Ferreira so, up in Long Island. Yeah, it's amazing that two of the initial players on the Wounded Warrior Empathy softball team are now uh, police officers first, but they're also bilateral amputees. Yeah, and it's 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 amazing to see to see the story and what but and what these guys, you know, what they go through as far as um, as far as that and what you know having to. I remember we saw Zach and just you know still having some issues as far as uh, you know like I said the blistering and I'm sure here it's a little bit different. But you said the the technology and how they, you know, how the prosthetics fit right. How they're aren't they they're all form fit to the to the nub as as they call it. And then what they have the sock that goes over it on top of, you know, the, on, then then the prosthetic, correct? Yeah, a lot of them have a gel liner in between there too. But uh, um, yeah, it's amazing what technology and the determination of some of these guys, you know, have followed through on things. Uh, and as we talked about earlier, they're getting older. They had to find a job, an occupation. Uh, they had to find a place in life first before they could do any kind of softball or baseball playing and um uh, you know it's it's talked about like i said some of these guys and most of them are younger kids right when when they first came back these kids these are what 21 22 years old coming coming out and wanting to figure out how to do it they're not i mean granted there were some older guys you had a couple guys from uh desert storm uh right todd and uh tom carlo yeah and tommy carlo so you had some older guys that were you know from long time ago that were a part of this as well. But most of these are just young kids, right? That are, that are coming out, but now they're turning into men and, you know, families, educations, and, uh, and just with a you know, good head on their shoulders. Well, you remember Matt Kinsey, who was probably one of our best softball players. Talked about uh, yesterday. He, yeah. He's been with us since day one in baseball. Um, he went to junior college to play baseball and, uh, it didn't work out, so he joined the military, but he plays third base and pitches for us, and he's probably one of our top pitchers, and he's pitching on, uh, you know, a below-knee amputee. But to continue the conversation, Matt told me the other day, he's 37 now, and I'm like, holy hell, where did the years go? It's Yeah, it's it's amazing to, to see that, right? Because these are, these are kids just looking for something, and now they're – you know, they, I mean, how often do you talk to these guys that are, you know, just the softball guys and, or, you know, I know you talk to the baseball guys, but the guys that the original group that you had, you know, the Greg Reynolds and Nick Clarks, the guys that are, do you still keep in touch with these guys? I, I do some of them and the baseball players, obviously I stay in touch with them constantly because we're, we always have a good conversation or good humor going on our team. And, uh, you know, so I stay in touch with a couple of the uh, older softball players and they always reach out to me um, to say hi, to check out how I'm doing, to thank me for getting them back into the game of softball and stuff like that. But the, the baseball team, the guys are younger and uh, they're just eager and ready to go where the uh, older guys have a little more, uh, different things happening in their life with their full-time job, their children, um, their wife. So we all know what comes first and then, you know, playing a sport is second. Yeah, you, you're right. And it's these, some of these older guys that uh, we talk about Tommy Carlo, you know, you know what he's been through. He's got to be now what in his sixties, maybe Is that about right. He's got to be pushing that. He has to be with, I mean, he's been through, yeah, you talk about a man's been through hell and beyond with even coming back after being back in here and, and seeing and hearing the stories. You know, I remember when I first saw met you guys in, in Sulphur, Louisiana, Kyle Earl, you know, lost a hand. And I guess he had the surgeon fuse the wrist bones together so he could use it as 
so his rifle could sit on his hand so he's able to shoot and use to be able to balance it since he didn't have a hand i mean hearing these stories of guys you know greg reynolds losing his, his arm completely and still being able to handle a, a softball bat um running you know running around it's it's just unfathomable to see these guys and the smile that's on their face especially when they're together you know that camaraderie they have from the military but at the same time the kids that come out i mean these camps are are huge you're you're not just drawing five ten kids at these camps are you no not at all and uh if you're mentioning names there's a couple of players that graduated from the softball to baseball uh Lonnie Godet, um, Carlo Adame, uh, you know, they're still with us. They're still playing. Um, but I've seen them uh, get up there in a couple of years. They both are married now. They both have kids. And, you know, they have other responsibilities in their life, too. Uh, Matt Kinsey, um, he even works at a baseball facility teaching baseball lessons. That's how serious he's taking it. And he's coached some uh, younger te travel teams. And um, these guys are having a good time. They are. And, and, and they don't want people, they don't want people's sympathy or anything else, right? They just want to be normal. They want to feel normal. And that was my first thought going out when traveling with you guys is what are people, is that what people are thinking? Are they thinking that, you know, that they're just wanting some empathy for everything else? And, and, more, and the more the guys are just, no, we just want to be normal people, right? We're we're no different. You okay? We're missing a, a a limb, but at the same time, but they're more than capable of of you know, like you said, com competing and and whatever it is. I mean, you said being police officers and just being able to get back into society as a normal as a normal human. Well, to put that into perspective, um, a news station came to one of our baseball games, and it was a female reporter, and the first, she wanted to talk to one of the players, so. After the game was over, um, she went up to one of the players and her question was, what's it like being an amputee playing baseball? And the player said, I think you got that backwards. I'm a baseball player first and I just happened to be an amputee. And <laughs> and it's and the, and, the, and the group that you have is is definitely a comedic bunch for sure right i mean they they're competitive but at the same time they do have fun with the fans and um and it wasn't like i said it wasn't just a circus to show up they're competitive they have fun but it, you know and it's it's the message that you're trying to to promote and but it's not even just the baseball side you've also talked run into people from different right different athletes amputees right you were from uh even female athletes as well correct oh absolutely um we meet all kinds i mean there's a couple of female softball players in college playing right now um but with the coaches curtis pride and len whitehouse and then guys like you that come out and carlos chantrez that come out and assist us uh they are all business on the field they the fun happens when they step out of the uh, the baselines, but on the field, Curtis expects the highest output from these guys, and um, he lets them know that. He keeps them in line and makes them understand and appreciate the game. It's not a joke. Uh, you know, do the best you can, take it seriously, and uh, you know, we've won games because of his coaching. Um, you know, Curtis is what in his mid fifties now. And we have literally seen him coach this team so well that we've won games because of his coaching. And I never knew that was possible. Yeah, you're right. Being able to bring a group of guys together and do that. And is he still coaching the, is the, the, the baseball team in D.C.? Yes, he is. He's still the head baseball coach for Gallaudet University. And I would say he's probably on about his 12th season there. Can tell the people about that university. It's all, are they all legally deaf players? Is that how the. Yeah. You have to have a hearing law or well, everyone in the student or all the students in the university have a certain level of hearing loss from profoundly deaf, to, uh, totally deaf um, to get into the university. So his team is all um, deaf baseball players and, you know, I've gone to see him play a number of teams. It's amazing. He, Curtis can communicate with them, like, unbelievably. He, he, he can sign. He can read lips. 
Uh, so he, he's good. It's amazing what he can do. I can't imagine being a head baseball coach at that university unless you ha- were able to read lips and sign, do sign language. Yeah, I do remember. Yeah, talking with Curtis, he had to actually look just to make sure you had his attention to know. But, you know, you talk about being able to do that and then to communicate with your guys, right? To be able to, for those guys, have to understand Curtis. Um, and you know, that communication process and it's, and like you said, it's a learning curve for them, but at the same time, it, you know, it helps everybody involved. Correct. Absolutely. Uh, you know, you know, it, Curtis can talk, uh, nasally and like with a muffled voice. And then sometimes when players are first on our team, they're having a little problem, maybe understanding them, but Curtis knows when to take the time, slow down, uh, get close to the player, uh, speak to them that way, and and communicate in a way that they all understand. The um, and so you guys played at least the last weekend. Are you guys? What's the next trip plan for your uh, baseball boys? Yeah, we've got a couple inquiries in, and you know, I think you know it. It, it costs about fifteen thousand dollars for uh, our team to travel for a three day weekend tournament. And then probably close to twenty thousand if we go away for the week. But um, it, we're always getting pulled in certain directions. But um, we've been playing MSBL All Star teams uh, lately, and that seems to be a pretty good fit because these guys can have a schedule that lets them go away for three days a lot easier than for a week. Because, like we've talked about a couple times. Uh, they're married, they have kids, they have occupations that they don't get a whole week off right away. So um, probably the next thing will be, um, we got a couple of things, one for November, one for December. Um, haven't been finalized yet, but um, both in Florida. Okay. Trying to plan it out is, is the big thing with all the guys doing working and everything else. So I remember, take me back, David, a few years when you guys went to Japan and I remember being in Florida for this for training for that, and the baseball that was going to be played. Refresh my memory and how that was. It wasn't a regular baseball, correct? Well, it was the size of the baseball. That's right. Okay, but it was hard rubber. That's right. And you guys, and you guys went to. How did that even come about, though? I mean, where did this even come to? Is this where the baseball part of it started, or were you guys? I can't remember if you guys had already been playing baseball. No. Well. Baseball had the baseball team hadn't been started yet, okay. but um, there's a world physically challenged baseball tournament. And I'd say about six countries have teams and it's always hosted and held in uh, Japan. Well, one year the U S team didn't do very well. So I received a phone call and asking if I could get up a team to go and knowing that some of the guys had baseball backgrounds, I said, I think we could do that. And every team was funded through this uh, Japanese organization. So uh, that's why we had the the three-day uh, camp to get ready to go do that. But that was the first time we've ever played with a, a baseball that the size of a baseball, hard, but hard rubber, and it literally can take a bounce. I remember those guys were hitting them with the fungo where it would almost flatten out as if you would almost like an egg yolk and the ball where you said, once it bounces out, it would take off all over the place. And I remember being down there. I think we play, play the guys played in some games in Florida and we were there doing it just to get used to this, this rubber ball. You were going to go play on all dirt baseball fields in Japan for a, what a week, five days a week or so. Right. So we played, I remember we played, uh, Florida Gulf Coast University is right here where I live in uh, Florida, and they have a very, very good uh, college baseball team, but they also have a very good club baseball team. So those were the guys from their club baseball team that came out to play us, but um, we did well against them. And it was, and you guys went over to Japan and played. What other countries were involved in that? Um, geez, I want to say Taiwan, South Korea, Puerto Rico, Japan. China, um, I'm not sure I'm getting. It was, I'm not sure I'm getting them all listed. But all I know is we won the gold medal. 
And they were com- competitive games as well, correct? Being able to, I mean, were they same as you guys, amputees as well as, is that what it was based on or was it just? Oh, yeah, yeah. they all had serious disabilities and amputations like like our team. But uh, Japan had never lost a game and had never and, and won every tournament, which is held every four years. But we defeated um, Japan 5 nothing and won the gold medal. And uh, Matt Kinsey was the pitcher in that game and got most valuable player. And that was that was how long ago? Four, five uh, years ago? Was, no, that was 2014. Oh my goodness, David! I'm getting old. I can't remember last week. And then, have you guys been back since doing that, or or have they just created taking on another baseball organization team to go? I, I haven't been. I was under the impression that you know Curtis and I. Uh, we did, and Casey Dago, uh, Jenny Finch's husband, who was our pitching coach, we went and we did so well, we were afraid to go back and lose. <laughs> and it's tough because those guys wouldn't want to lose. Uh, if our fan, the people listening right now don't understand Japanese fields are, they can turn to a horse track really quickly. Right. So it's both the prosthetics and that that baseball. And the, I don't was it even considered a baseball? I don't remember. I just no, remember it, holding it, it. It is a baseball. I have one on the shelf behind me. It's 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 a baseball. It's got seams on it. I, yeah, I do remember that. And just seeing it, they never said there is no way this is it, I imagine just taking one of those in the skin, almost like a dodgeball. It had that effect of where it would just seem to spread out if it if it hits you. And whatnot, but you know, doing that and see, I mean, it would go a long way too if you hit it, if you squared it up. Well, I remember Louisville Slugger, Louisville Slugger is prominent in Japan. So we got a whole bunch of baseballs through their reps in Japan ahead of time that were shipped to the US so we could start playing with that uh, baseball while we had the training camp in Florida. Those things, it's, I wonder if, if any of the teams have been back since to be able to do that, but. Man, that was I, I. Now I do remember the the ball. I mean, people have seen them, it, but it was. You're right. It was, and they could throw it pretty. You could throw it pretty hard as well. I would say you could almost throw it as as hard and as fast as a baseball. It's just the the biggest thing I noticed was that when maybe a middle infielder was throwing a long infield throw, it could bounce uh, towards the first baseman, and it would bounce a lot more than. A regular baseball. Yes, one of those pink balls that you would get combined with a, with a baseball. And what was the thinking behind that baseball as, as opposed to just a regular baseball? What was? Well, I think that's exactly what it was. It was a safety factor that they used that because they felt a baseball was too hard and that if someone got beamed with a regular baseball, the damage could be worse than with a hard, hard rubber ball. And and these are some grown men hitting this ball. And like I said, if you squared this up, it was it was coming at you, and it was and it would move too, like you said, it, in, in with the wind and everything else. So, uh, but you know, to, to see that like all all over the place, and just see how you know how big this has become since since you started this, what ten years ago, eleven years ago now. Yes, it's been a while. So, and you're still involved with with the prosthetic side of it. Um, are they, you guys still doing a? your kind of spring training type of thing every year? Are you inviting them, everybody down to do it? Or is it just kind well, of a pick and We choose? really don't have to do that anymore um, because it seems like we're always playing. And and that was just to get us going uh, in baseball and getting a, a set team. But now having a, a pretty much of an active roster and people reaching out to us um, on a constant basis – there, uh, there's a couple pitchers in the major uh, major college baseball division one that have you know reached out to us said you know when their eligibility's up they would like to consider to come out and pitch for us uh, yeah there's there's like two from division one that um, throw pretty hard and uh, if they want to come on board I think they can help us immensely and some of these guys too could just be a missing toe right at the least. That can be considered a right. Is that could be? It could be, but we don't have anyone with that much of a less of an amputation. We have so most of ours are a foot, a lower leg, an arm, a hand. Yeah, it's 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 just like I said, amazing, David. These guys are able to do this, and 
compete, do that work, families travel around and, uh, and, and create awareness for what you guys, what you created, you know, 10, 11 years ago, but to see that the sponsors that are, you know, all on board to help, help these guys become what, you know, what they, you know, what they are. There's, you see the guys here all the time, um, with the softball stuff with a lot big military here as far as the retired guys and seeing that and uh you know you talk about walter reed and, and the hospital here in san antonio if, are they calling you too as well saying hey we've got guys coming out and and just and i'm sure the word is spread like wildfire especially through military about guys coming back that are you know amputees and looking to to get back into it do you get calls about that on a daily basis or how's yeah, that working we still get recommendations and some of our players even know other players that uh, are coming up through the ranks that, you know, maybe we should take a look at them too. And like I said, there's a couple more division one uh, pitchers that we would really entertain um, having on our team. We, we just uh, picked up another player that was a division one player, believe it or not, he was in a lot on a lawn riding lawnmower accident and uh, cutting the grass on a bank at a university and the riding lawnmower tilted and flipped and they were rolling down the hill as he put up his hand to uh, protect himself and the blade cut off half his hand. And believe it or not, in 11 hour surgery, they have just reattached his hand top part of his hand to the other part of his hand wow it's the stories that, that these guys have you know a lot of them have been you know ieds for the for the most part what i've gathered but are you here are there any other stories from those guys that weren't ieds that were something other you know i know greg always talks about he got bit by a shark uh, yeah. <laughs> right was was his excuse right. But uh, any any of them have any good stories about how they lost theirs? I know Leonard had one. He was on uh, he was on the, the national news one night, correct? He and he and Aza were on there talking about it. Uh, the IED that went off, right? They had video of it of the entire thing happening. Yeah, one of the one of the channels was over in uh, I'm not I can't remember if he was Iraq or Afghanistan. He was a dog handler, and uh, there was trying to sniff out bombs and. And they were filming him and when he stepped on a bomb. So, I mean, there's a story, but there's a story that was recorded and, and is on the internet as of today. Uh, Leonard Anderson, it's amazing what he does with what he's working with. So tell people, but Leonard's got, I think he has his thumb and is it thumb and pinky only on the left hand? And no, then, on the right hand. It's on, on his right, right hand. hand. Okay, the left hand's the prosthetic that's tied to that holds on to the bat the baseball and then bat. onto the baseball bat. Yep. Okay. So yeah. he's yeah, so that's he's one of the ones that's, that doesn't have but it, who's got the best one of those stories that you've heard from that group of guys? Um Well, it, it, military wise, I usually don't talk about the guy's yeah. injury. Yeah. That, that's not a good story to have. No, but don't, you know how when we're around them, they want to, you know, oh, they'll yeah. talk about it. You know, that's, it's, it's just to hear the story, right. Of how it's, of, of how it happened, you know, like talk about with, you know, with, with Greg or with, with Leonard, because of seeing, I'm just wondering if, you know, some of them would just, oh, I was just being stupid and something happened or whatnot, or just, you know, in the middle of you know, combat type of stuff. That's what I was just, this, those, just those stories. I guess now, it's more. Leonard's still playing softball at a high level. Um, he's not on, on our baseball team, mm. but he's still playing baseball, uh, softball at a high level. He plays for, for the fallen, um, the top men's softball team, uh, all military guys. Um, uh, he's the only amputee on the team, but, uh, that goes to show you the ability he has but once again, these guys got, aren't getting any younger. Leonard's going to be in his late thirties by now. Yeah, these it's a, like you said they just seem to be when I first saw them, just these you know young kids. And like you said, now they're they're turning into men, having families, and uh, and seeing the, the maturation process of that. I mean, you never would have thought coming back if they had an opportunity to do that and to be where they are. But you know, I still keep in touch with these guys throughout whether it's on social media or just through text, just checking on to see how they are, you know, and, and seeing that, uh, you know, the, the, the tags that come up from, from 10 years ago, the original group of guys 
and uh, you know, just going through. And you have it's all branches of the military, right? And it's uh, when it when it first started. So I mean, it's it's amazing to see where they are, the success they're having, and the fun they're having. But like you said, it can be at a competitive level, even uh, and, and doing it all over the country is just just amazing. Well, you know, I want to I tell people they're all walks of life. Uh, they've gotten college degrees. They've gotten married. They've gotten divorced. They've had kids. Um, they've got careers. Uh, they, it, they're no different than anyone else other than they're playing with an amputation. Yeah. But, and you never thought it would be to the extent to where it is now, right? It was just something that you know, to do this and, but to see how it's grown. And I'm, I'm wondering how the numbers have multiplied since you started the softball part of it to how many more people have come out and being understanding that they're, they're more than able to do it if they see these guys. And I think that's what those camps were about as well, right in the beginning, just to get people out and the, the awareness of saying it's okay. Right. Cause I've seen some, you know, the kids that come through there and the, the, the smile on their face, seeing somebody that, Right, that looks like them with an amputation. I go, wait, wait, that guy's doing what? I can do, I can do this. Now there's, I mean, you hear about these, there's what hockey teams around, right? That are amputee hockey teams all over. So I mean, th- I mean, this is just for something just taken off. And did you ever think it would get to this point? Well, absolutely not. Um, but I guess I realize how much everything has transitioned but when you have an amputee baseball player pitching to an amputee baseball catcher and both of them are missing an arm that's pretty remarkable especially playing at this level yeah and it's and it's and it like you said it is definitely fun to watch to see the transition of how fast they're able to do that trans you said from catch the throw and everything else. And to be able to, to compete, swing a baseball bat, the, the amount of strength it requires to do it. Right. I mean, these guys, I think, uh, Greg's got the world record for the most one arm pushups or something. Yeah. I'm not sure what the number is, but Greg could do quite a few pushups. Yeah. And it's, and it's amazing to see, to see that, to see these guys, to see you guys and, um, just, just being around. And you know, like you said, you never thought of, of, of what it could create and what, and what it brings about, but, you know, this thing is just scratching the surface of, of what it's doing. And, you know, it reaches out to all these other military guys to to see that they've got an opportunity, regardless of what it is, to to be able to continue and have fun with it. So, you know, commend you for for being for taking that lead with this, David, many, many years ago and having fun with it. Like I said, I've ha- had so much fun with you guys traveling around, um, seeing different different cities playing, watching these guys have fun and watching them grow to see where they are now. Well, you're not done yet. We're going to get you out there again. Oh, for sure. Definitely have to get out um, and, and get out and get all and uh, talk to some of these guys. You know, I'm, I'm going to have to have Matt on here at some point and tell him about how he's been. Uh, man, he seems to be the field general when he's out there, the leader, even though he might not be the old. Well, he might be the oldest guy now to be out there. I mean, he's, he's very do- intense. He takes it serious. Uh, but um I was just thinking, Kevin, you're old enough to be some of these guys' father now. <laughs> oh yeah, but it's, <laughs> sometimes you're right, and it's but and it's it's interesting though that to to see that their their growth and uh, and what it means to them and to even people around here. It's so you know I'm looking forward to uh, where this continues to go, Dave, and hopefully we can. I know there's some men's leagues around here, you know, to oh, be able to yeah. set something there's up. MS, there's MSBL teams all over the United States. To give you an example, we went to Detroit. There's 54 MSBL men's teams in the Detroit metro area, and they are not the largest city uh, in numbers of teams. So there's obviously two cities that have bigger numbers and teams than Detroit, but 54 teams of just uh, men's senior baseball league players. That's amazing. And no, I could not go out there and compete and play anymore. But there are guys that go out and play and do that stuff and um, and see it. And there's, you said there's some, in, some, is there a big contingent in Florida? Um, yes, all over Florida. But where I live, uh, they just started that league uh, in the last year or two. And they started with four teams. I heard they're going up to six or eight already. 
you'd be amazed how many um, guys miss the game of baseball. Um, and they just look for a chance to get out. And, you know, with it being against ages that you're, that you're the same age, that the ability and to play at that level is, you know, there's not a 60 year old guy throwing to a 20 year old batter. So it, it's an even playing field. It is. It's fun. It's fun to watch because it, it, you're right. It's competitive, but at the same time, it's it, it's interesting. And and you're right. Some of these guys get heated as well. I'm sure you know they get they get can get pretty upset depending on because like you said, it's a competitive nature that they have. We have seen some men senior baseball players, pitchers in particular, that have rubber arms. In other words, their team goes to a tournament, and those guys pitch every game and every inning. Well, we're our team. We go. We we have them throw hard, and they they pitch maybe six innings, and then we put relievers in. But can you imagine being fifty years old and pitching seven games in one weekend in a tournament? It, maybe it's just that rest that they hadn't played in a while, and they've they still got it in there, right? You never know what what they're feeding these people these days, and being able to do that. But and you're right, and to be able to throw hard, not just just lobbing it up there. I mean, they're, they're actually pitching able to, to throw it and, and, uh, and, and do that and see how competitive they are. And the guys here, they, like I said, they play, there's some leagues here and they're always playing and, but now nah, I'm not going to get out there, but it's, it's, it is interesting to watch for sure. It's not just a, just a joke, you know, men's beer league type of stuff. It's, it's competitive and they want to win. They absolutely do. So, but you know, it's amazing though to see, like I said, what, what you started and where this is going and, and having fun with it. And like you said, you can thank your dad who just turned 90, correct? Uh, 90. 90 years old, and he's a physical specimen. <laughs> Playing golf all the time, living in Florida, enjoying it and everything. So make sure you give your, your mom and dad a big hug for me because your dad's been uh, – I'm sure he's out playing golf right about now, isn't he? Oh, no, well, not, not now with no. the weather. With the if weather. He, is, he played this morning, and he's off the course by now because of the rain. But um, my dad has been retired longer than he worked. That's amazing. That's when you know you're successful when you you're retired longer than you worked. Yep, and for 90 years old, you wouldn't think he's a day over 60 when you see him. So, but make sure you tell them hello, give him a big hug for me, and I, uh, I appreciate you jumping on here, David, and and, uh, and and talking and just filling people in on uh, on what you what you created and and where it's going, and you know, hopefully we can get you guys to come out here in Texas and find something for you to come out, bring the baseball guys around, and have a big old. Uh, big old tournament or something around here but you know like i said continue success with it and i'm looking forward to helping out with you guys anytime you need it so okay i appreciate it kevin and i want to thank you for just being a friend uh being involved uh promoting us thanking us uh you've always been uh an advocate for us and uh we greatly appreciate it absolutely that's what that's what i'm here for to help out and like i said just making these guys better you know whatever it is they're doing and he said, "Having fun, so we'll uh, we'll have to continue this down the road in a few years and see how this uh, how this all transitions. See how big this is actually going to get. So, I appreciate it all, David, and uh, look forward to talking to you later on. Thank you very much, Kevin. Right. Thanks, David. 